Yeah, Father God, we thank you for amazing grace. Amazing grace that sets us free. Amazing grace that calls blind eyes to see. It says this in Hebrews that now we can boldly enter because of that amazing grace we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place and then the writer says let's go right in let's go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him God we thank you for that grace that allows us access to your presence we thank you for the grace that's found in your word, we thank you, God, that you gave us access to your word. And so in this moment, we come with grateful hearts, with humble hearts, with open hearts, that you would speak to us this morning. Through your word, we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. One, turn to the person next to you and just say to them, it is my honor to be sat next to you this morning. just want to welcome you into um, part five of our message series. Who's enjoyed this series? We've had loads of really good comments. I, I don't mind. I've really enjoyed the study on this series, just sitting down, looking at a passage that you think you know, and then you dive into the passage a little bit more, and it just really opens up something uh, new to you. So I've just really, I've really enjoyed studying for this passage, let alone kind of bringing the messages and, and listening to the messages. And thank you to, to Hannah, to Hannah, to Rob for just some incredible teaching on these aspects of the armor of God. What I'd love you to do, we're going to dive into the text. So I'd love you, uh, if you haven't already, grab your Bibles out, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 10, and it says this, Paul says this, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And translations say, you know, put on the whole armor of God. Not just some of it, but put on the whole armor of God. It says it again a few verses later. Paul says, put on every piece of God's armor, all of it. You can't just pick and choose kind of the armor you wear. Roman soldiers didn't pick and choose the armor they wore. Rob said, a great message last week. If you haven't heard it, please do go back and watch it. It's on YouTube. We've got it on our podcast. Where Rob said about the, the reason the Roman soldiers started to fall away is because they started to not bother about their helmets. All right, this, this armor, there's not a choice about what you can wear and what you can't. It all has to go together. And for these Roman soldiers, there were six essential pieces of armor. There was a belt uh, or, or a loin belt, there was a breastplate, shoes, a shield, a helmet, and a sword. And Paul says, you need to put all of this on, not just the bits that look nice, not just the bits that feel comfortable, not just the bits that make you feel better or make you look good. We've got to put it all on. Why? So we can stand firm against the, uh, the strategies of the devil. And if you were here on week one, we talked about that phrase, stand firm. It's two Greek words. And the first word is the word stainei, which means to stand. And it's not just like standing at the bus stop, but it's an active verb. It's I'm standing with intention. So I'm standing firm. The other word is prose, which means I'm actually standing with a kind of forward motion. I'm standing with a forward intention. I'm not defensive. I'm offensive. I'm not leaning back. I'm leaning in. I'm pushing forward. So Paul says this is, this is about moving forward, not standing still, not kind of de defending yourself, but actually pushing into whatever God, whatever the devil is kind of coming against you. And Paul says, listen, do this so you can stand firm. And the devil would love to attack you. Can I just say that? Happy Sunday, everyone, but that's what we're up against. The devil would love to attack you, and, and the, the way he does it is not actually physically normally. It's usually through your mind. It's usually through your thoughts. The first thing the devil ever does in creation is get Adam and Eve to question God. And he gets Adam and Eve, and he says, did God really say that? And through creation, through history, the devil's been doing that ever since. And so a lot of this armor, while Paul's using a, a physical example, it's actually a spiritual metaphor for something. Because actually the, the battle isn't physical. You know, it says in the Bible, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. But we're fighting against something spiritual. There's a battle for our mind. There's a battle for our thoughts. There's a battle for our 
emotions. And we read it here, and we've got this armor that we get in verse 13. It says, put on every piece of God's armor. So after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Put on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. Put on the peace for shoes uh, that comes from the good news. Hold up the shield of faith. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And I'm going to close this series by looking at the sword. Can I say before I start, swords are cool. When we planned this series, I said to Hannah, I'm doing the sword. Because swords are cool. And I don't know what happens. and Maybe it's just a boy thing, but there's, there's, there becomes an age at a boy where anything slightly long and thin becomes a sword. Anything. Twigs, sticks, um, pencils, bits of pole, cardboard tubes. Anyone in school made swords out of stickle bricks? Anyone remember stickle bricks? Um, all those, I've got, I took a photo because I made one, made one earlier. I made, I made some swords out of those linking blocks you can get. I don't know if we've got the photo. There we go. Swords are cool. And what I thought we'd do, just to kind of get us into this message, there's loads of famous swords in TV and in film. So what I want to do is do a little bit of a quiz this morning and see if you can name some famous swords. So we'll put the first one up. Can anyone name this sword or what the TV program this sword is from? It is He-Man. It is He-Man. Okay, next one. It is Star Wars. It is Star Wars. Thank you very much. Next one. This is before my time, I'll admit. <laughs> it's not the Three Musketeers. Zorro. It is Zorro. It is Zorro. Okay, next one. Thundercats, with good man, whoever that was. It is Thundercats. And the last one, this might trick you. It is Excalibur from the Sword in the Stone. If anyone remembers it, well done. If you've got any of those, give yourself a pat on the back. Now, they're all famous swords. They're all swords you would see on TV and in film. And they've got one thing in common. They're actually quite long. They're quite long swords, but when we look at the sword Paul's talking about, in the Greek, he uses the word makaria, which isn't a long sword that you kind of imagine people swinging around. It's actually a really short sword. And I've got a, an example here. Um, this is the kind of sword that Paul is talking about. It's, it's not a long sword. It's about 18, uh, 20 inches long. It's double-edged, double-bladed. We've seen that before in the Bible, the, the idea of a double-edged sword. It was light. It was easy to carry. And the way you'd use it wasn't you'd just kind of slash it around, but the way you'd use it was in a stabbing action. This was a stabbing sword. I'm glad the children have gone out. I'll just, I'll just say this. But, but the, this was me meant for basically stabbing. And Paul says that this sword is the word of God. And then Paul uses the Greek word, if you're into the Greek, he uses the Greek word rhema. And when you look through the Bible, a, a rhema word is when God gives a specific word uh, to a specific person for a specific situation. One way of describing it in a, in a bit of older languages, it's, it's a quickened word. It's a word that kind of comes alive in you when you hear it, that when, when it's read out to you, when you hear it, something jumps inside your spirit and, and you know that you've heard from God. It's, that's what a rhema word is. And I just want to be clear here, a rhema word can't be just something you found online. It can't be a quote from a famous theologian or a famous kind of preacher. It actually has to come from the word of God. It has to. Now, now people speak prophetically, yes. People give words of wisdom, yes. People give words of knowledge, yes. Totally, I believe that. I believe the Spirit moves in that way. But for a rhema word, it has to be from the Bible. It has to be in the, in the word of God. And um, that, that, that's what a rhema word is. And Jesus says to the disciples, he says this, listen, I'm going away soon, but when the Father sends the advocate, the Holy Spirit, when the Father sends the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything, and he'll do what? He'll remind you of everything I have told you. Holy Spirit will remind you of the word of God. That's that rhema word. It's the Holy Spirit reminding you of the word of God in a specific situation, in a specific time. So when you're afraid, there's a specific word for you. When you're went to make you brave, when you're tired, there's a specific word that is going to give you supernatural energy. When, when you feel like you're alone, there's going to be a spiritual word that will give you comfort. When you're facing temptation, there's a specific word that is going to help you to stand. Church, can I tell you, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, there's a word for whatever you're facing. It's here in the Word of God. And in the Bible, there are two Greek words for, for word, actually. There's the word rhema, which Paul uses, and then there's the, 
uh, the, the word logos, which basically means the general word of God, the whole word of God. That's the Bible, it's the logos, it's the whole word of God. And if you hear at the start of the series, we said that actually we're called to wear the belt of truth, and actually that's, that's the logos, that's the whole word of God. The Greek word Paul uses is aletheia, and it means divine truth. So we, we, we have the divine truth wrapped around us, and we said that actually the sword hangs from the belt. So the rhema word of God has to be attached to the belt. It has to be attached to the word of God. And that's what I kind of want to, want to help you with this, actually, because it's the belt of truth that holds everything together. It's the belt of truth that holds the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness on. It's the belt of truth that holds the shield on us. Um, it's the word of God that helps us in defense, but it's the word of God that helps us in attack. Do you, do you get me? And this Roman sword that Paul's describing, there's ancient Roman writings, and it says this, that the Roman soldiers, when they were being trained, it says they were taught not to cut, but to thrust. Uh, a stroke with the edges, although made with ever so much force, seldom kills as the vital parts of the body are defended, both by bones and armor. But on the contrary, a stab, though it penetrates two inches is generally fatal. And, 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 fatal. And, and Romans were taught not to kind of slash and swing, they're taught... To stab, it's all about a well-placed wound. It's all about a well-placed action. They don't need a long sword to kill their enemies. They just needed one that could stab. Can I suggest the same is true for us? We don't need reams of Bible text. We just need a well-placed word. We just need one word that we can actually thrust forward and attack the enemy. So it's not about waving your Bible around randomly, but it's about that, that one placed, that well-placed verse that, that God puts into your heart, and that's going to be enough to send the devil packing. Jesus did this. If you look at Matthew's gospel, in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, we get this narrative of, of Jesus being taken into the, the wilderness by the devil. And, and it says this, that Jesus was led into the spirit, in, led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. So you've got Jesus who's hungry. That's Jesus' situation. Jesus is hungry physically. The devil comes along and says, well, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, because the devil can see Jesus is hungry. So here's the temptation. Here's the issue. Jesus says this, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy there, and it's a specific scripture for a specific situation. That rhema word is specially quickened in Jesus' spirit for that specific situation. So the devil takes him uh, either in a vision or kind of, and I don't know really how this works, but the devil takes him to Jerusalem and he shows him the highest point of the temple and says, well, if you're the son of God, jump off. Because the scripture says that God will protect you. They'll hold you up with your hands. You won't even hurt your foot on a stone. That's really interesting because you've got the devil quoting scripture. The devil's quoting Psalm 91, and, and it's interesting, you know, the devil knows scripture as well. The devil knows the Bible, and he, one of his favorite tactics is, is to take the Bible and quote it out of context, and he's been doing it for centuries. It's caused church splits. It's caused denominational divides. It, it's caused people to fall away from faith because they've listened to the devil take scripture out of context. The, the whole Psalm, Psalm 91, is about trusting in God and not being reckless, Psalm 91 is all about saying, God is my refuge, so I'm not going to be reckless with my life. I'm going to trust in God. And so, so Satan takes that one line, he takes it out of context to try to get Jesus to test God. And you know if you text, take a text out of context, all you're left with is a con. And that's what the devil would love to do. He'd love to put scriptures in your mind, scriptures in your heart that will, that will be taken out of, con, out of context and, you, and they can be used to justify all sorts of stuff. But look at what Jesus says. He says this, and the scriptures also say, you don't test God. And again, it's a specific word for a specific situation. Verse 8 says, the devil showed Jesus the whole world and says, I'll give all this to you if you'll kneel down and worship me. But Jesus knows Satan on the back foot and he says, do you know what? Get out. Get out of here. And I love that, that Jesus calls it, tells, tells the devil to clear off. I love that Jesus has got that authority. And church, can I tell you, you've got the authority to tell the devil to clear off. That, that you can tell the devil to get lost. That, that when you carry the word of God, the Holy Spirit, it'll draw out a specific word in your life. So actually you can spiritually stab the devil and say, oh, get lost. 
So I'm not having that because I'm more than a conqueror. The word of God says I'm loved. The word of God says I'm redeemed. The word of God says I'm valued. The word of God says I'm no longer a slave to fear. On guard, Satan, because I'm coming. Swords are cool. The Bible says the word of God is alive and it's powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword and it's going to cut Satan up. So Jesus responds, get lost, Satan. The scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him. It's Deuteronomy 6. And can you see just in those texts that whatever Jesus was up against, it was a specific word from scripture for that specific situation. It's a rhema word. Look what happens next. The devil went away. The devil literally goes away. And can I encourage you that when the Holy Spirit quickens a word in you, when he, when he quickens scripture in you and you use it against the devil, he, he has to run away because he's got nothing to fight against you. That sword of the spirit, that rhema word, it's, it's a supernatural spiritual weapon that renders the devil powerless. And I just want to urge you, if you feel like you're being attacked in any area of your life, open the word of God. Open the word of God and, and, and the word of God will speak to you and you'll be able to stand firm and attack back. It says this in Revelation, the accuser of our brothers and sisters, that's the devil, he's been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. But they have defeated him, how? By the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. See, see the devil knows he's been defeated. The devil knows he's done. He knows he's finished. He knows his end is coming. He was defeated on the cross by Jesus' blood. But sometimes he's not defeated on our minds. So the devil knows he's defeated, but sometimes we don't. And it's when we speak out the word of God, actually, we stop the devil in his tracks and we, we, we actually stab him with the sword of the Spirit. That's the idea here. It's the word of God. He, he'll only be defeated in your mind by your testimony, by the way. It's, another preacher's not going to do that for you. Another Bible teacher isn't going to do that for you. God TV isn't going to do that for you. It has to be your word coming out of your mouth, coming out of your spirit. That's what defeats the devil. So how do we do it? How do we have those specific words when we need them? And, and one really popular technique is to kind of throw your Bible open and hope for the best. You know, you might just stick your finger in a random page in the Bible and just hope God's going to speak to you. And, and you, do you know what? He might. He might speak to you that way. Nine times out of ten, he might not, you know, and there's that famous story of a guy who was just praying for a word from God, so he threw open his Bible, and he put his finger down, and it says this, Jesus, uh, Judas threw the money into the temple and left, then he went away and hanged himself. Well, this guy wasn't too keen on that, so he thought, well, I'll try again. And he read John 13, which says, go and do likewise. So he's even less impressed. So we had another go, and he landed in Luke 10, which says, what you're about to do, do quickly. <laughs> do you know what? We've got the ability to pull up scriptures that are going to help us. And, and I want to suggest maybe we need to look how Jesus did it. Because they're kind of flicking open your Bible and hoping for the best. It ain't going to work. So we need to know this scripture. How do we do it? Well, it's fascinating, because at the start of Jesus' ministry, Jesus goes into the temple and it says that he goes into the temple, they hand a scroll, this big scroll, uh, the Isaiah scroll, they call it. They hand this scroll to him, and it says this, it's fascinating, it says that the scroll of the Isaiah was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written, and then he reads this incredible text. Now, I won't read that, but it's that little line, it says, he found the place. These scrolls aren't like our Bibles. They didn't have chapters and verses and little markers to help you out. It was just one long, long, long piece of text. All Jesus had was this one massive scroll, and Jesus finds it. So I want to suggest, for Jesus to find it, he had to know where it was. He couldn't stand there for three hours going, no, 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 no. Jesus had to know where it was, and he just finds it. In this scroll, and actually, if you, if you read it, if you compare the actual Isaiah passage and what Jesus read, Jesus skips a bit, but no one noticed. But Jesus knew the scriptures well enough to be, because he knew where it was. And, and so, so how did Jesus do that? And you might say, well, because Jesus is God. Jesus just knows scripture. But actually, there's something else. If you look in Luke uh, chapter 2, if you read the timeline of Jesus, we get this birth narrative where Jesus is born in Bethlehem, his parents flee to Egypt. We get, we get nothing then for about 10 years. 
And then Jesus pops up in the temple at 12 years old. Then we get nothing for another 18 years. But it's fascinating because Luke 2 says this. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and for the people. So for 18 years, we've got no records of Jesus at all. There's nothing that's ever been found that gives us any clue about Jesus' life in those 18 years. Other than this, Jesus grew in wisdom. 18 years of studying. 18 years of of soaking in Scripture, and then he walks into the synagogue and he finds the place in Isaiah because he knows where it is because he spent 18 years in the Bible. Do you know Jesus spends 30 years of his life training for three years of ministry? 30 years of training for three years of ministry. And and we know that by 12, Jesus was astounding the rabbis. And I I get Jesus is God. I I, I get that. But what I want to say is Jesus may not, wouldn't have had a specific word if he didn't know the word. Jesus couldn't give a specific word to the devil if he didn't know the word of God. And when we get people who have frequent rima words, they're the people who've made the written word of God central to their lives. You know, just like a, a, a Roman sword, that, that word hangs off the belt. It hangs off the belt of God's word. Um, can I be harsh but fair this morning? Do you know what harsh but fair means? I'm going to say something and some of you are going to go, ouch. But you know it's true. And I, and I, just, I need to explain that because I really feel I need to say this. And, I, and I, I, We've got this great phrase, I say this in love. Stop asking God for a word when he's already given you one. Stop asking God for a word when he's already given you enough. Do you know how many words there are in the Bible? 7,783,137. 7, I counted. 1,189 chapters, 66 books, straight from the heart of God. And we've got the audacity to leave this book closed and ask God for a word. Ouch. You cannot have a rhema word from God if you don't bother with this one. It ain't going to work. You cannot ask God for a word when he's given you a book full of them. And that's harsh. And I'm sorry, but it's fair. And I don't mean, I'm try, I don't mean this just in this church. I, I, think it's, I think it's a problem with Christendom that we, that we ask God for words and we just leave this on the side. Here's another one. God, God I need you word. But, but, and, and God says, but, but I've given you one. And you go, but I don't like that one, God. God, I need a word. And God says, here's loads of words. And you go, but... Eh. You know, we know what God says about something, but we don't like what he says. So we keep asking God for another one, and, and, and we do what Satan does, and we find a verse, you know, out of context that tries to justify something. You know, it might justify our opinion or justify an attitude. So here's an example, you know, God, my neighbor, is really annoying me. My neighbor's really bugging me. God, give me a word. So I'm going to go in my concordance and I'm going to look up neighbor and find out what God says about neighbors. Oh, Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. Let's have a look at another one, right? Neighbor's name is on. Proverbs 3, do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Well, all right, I won't hurt them, but I don't like them. So, so let's have another one. Let's have another one. Right, neighbor, neighbor. Right, Luke 10. Jesus is talking about neighbors. Which one of these is a neighbor? The one who showed him mercy. Now go and do the same. Sorry, Jesus, I'm not doing that. Right, let's have a look at another one. Okay, Romans, uh, uh, Romans 13, 8. If you love your neighbor, you'll fulfill the requirements of the law. Do you think God's making a point? But I don't like that either, so I'm going to look for another one. Okay, okay. Oh, Proverbs 25. Don't visit your neighbors too often, for they may come to hate you. Brenda, we haven't got to visit the neighbors anymore. Because the word of God says not to. You know, I can find verses that will tell you it's okay to be greedy. I can find verses that tell you it's okay to gossip. I can find verses that tell you that lying is justified. I can find verses that will justify every single sin there is, but I'd be taking every one of them out of context. 
And I'd be lying to you, and I'd be lying to myself because God's word is God's word. We can't change it. We can't alter it. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. And, 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 and we can't expect it to get it from anyone else either. You know, in a battle, no one else is going to come running in and give you a sword. No one came to Jesus and gave him the words to fight the devil with. Jesus had to do it himself. And this sword was something a Roman soldier carried all the time. It wasn't given for special occasions. And I, and I get that a friend or a speaker, they may come and give you a word that challenges you. It might move you. It might motivate you. It might encourage you. I believe in prophecy. I believe in words of encouragement, words of wisdom. I, I believe in all that. But the sword is something you carry for you to use. Look at what Paul says. He says this, put on every piece of God armor so you will be able to resist the enemy. After the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, put it on the belt of truth. Put on the peace that comes from God, from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the Spirit. Church, this is about you. This is about your battles, your issues, your fights, your victory, and it's you who has to take up the armor. You have to invest time in the Word of God. So that when the devil comes to attack, you know the truth. You know the Word of God. You know the truth about yourself. You know the truth about God. You know the promises He speaks over you. You know the power that resides in you, and you know it because you find it in His Word. Psalm 119, I love Psalm 119, it's a psalm about the word of God. It's a psalm where, where David talks about the word of God and it says this, your promise revives me, it comforts me in all my troubles. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Your word is my source of hope. God's word provides everything we need. Last verse and I'll, I'll close. Paul says this, let the message about Christ let this message, let this word in all its richness, let it fill your lives. Church, can I encourage you, can I plead with you, fill your lives with the word of God, with his truth, with his promises. It says this, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Talk about it. Study it. You know, the, the Jews had this principle where they carried the, the, they carried the Torah physically around with them on their arms and on their head. They carried the word everywhere they went. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God for thankful heart. You know, our worship is inspired by the word of God. And it's something we always say when we're looking and when we're talking to the worship team about a, a new song or something we want to bring. It always, is that what the Bible says? Are we singing truth? That our worship is inspired by the word of God. I want to ask the band to come and join me. And I know we're, we're slightly over time. But I want to charge you with this if I can. That as we kind of close this series. That, that we take responsibility for this. That we don't leave it to the person next to us. Because this is about you. This is about you and your Bible. This is about you and you having that word. Can we stand together? Because I want to encourage you, just as we stand to get dressed, because Paul says to put this on. He says, put on this stuff, put on this armor, which suggests to me at some point they took it off. Because you don't put something on unless you've taken it off. So there's this, this, there's this idea that even as Paul is writing, he's saying to these people, you, you've, guys, you've taken this off. But I want you to put it on again. And I want you to wear it. Church, before we leave this building, can we put our armor on? Can we put our armor on again? And I, and I want to charge you with this, that you would put on every piece, <coughs> excuse me, of God's armor. Put on the belt of truth. The word of God. Put on the body armor of God's righteousness. Put on the shoes of peace. Hold up the shield of faith. Put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Why don't we pray? Father God, would you help us leave here 
dressed for battle. Would you help us to leave here inspired and equipped by your word? May your word guide us. May it challenge us. May it motivate us. May it sustain us. God, give us a renewed passion for your word. God, help us to make it the central piece of our armor. God, dress us for battle, we pray. God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your word is the same. It never changes. It never returns void. It always achieves what it's set out to do. Your word has carried your people through centuries. Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, David, Mary, the great heroes of the faith, your word has carried them through. Your word has brought them through. And so we pray, same God, would you dress us in the same armor? Would you equip us in the same way? Would you empower us in the same way? We pray in your name. And all God's people said,